if you're watching online, um, let's go ahead and get get things started. If y'all want to stand, we're gonna kick off this morning with my lighthouse. <laughs>
collapsed this morning. That's the cry of our heart. It's what a beautiful name, the name of Jesus, the one that came and died on the cross for us so that we might have eternal life through belief in him, Lord. We give you thanks for that. We give you thanks for the price that was paid for our sins, the price that was paid for our lives so we might spend eternity with you. Lord, we look forward to that, that day. Lord, uh, today we, we just ask you to continue to, to uh, take this virus away from our country, from this world, Lord, and uh, teach us what you will through this. We pray it all in Jesus' name.
them see it, laying our path out before us. Give us the wisdom to, to follow you, to follow your way, and to give you all the glory. These things we pray in your name. Amen. <coughs> here today. Glad to have some of you back. and been here for a while. We're glad that you're in our in-person uh, worship service. We're thankful that you're here this morning and glad that you're with us. Uh, we're going to be doing a two-part uh, series. First one is, uh, it's all going to be on submission. We're going to do part one today and then next week we'll do part two. Okay? So it was kind of long so I cut it in half. <laughs> so I uh, want to make sure you guys get out fast enough to beat the Methodist, you know, uh, to the restaurant. So uh, we got to cut that cut that down a little bit so you can get out of here as uh, quickly as possible. So uh, we also want to remind you of our blue barrel that's been going around. Uh, how many have seen a commercial where Anna reaches in the blue barrel and throws the trash back at the car? Isn't that hilarious? I like that one. Well, there's also a new one. There's a little movie that's come out, and I don't know if you've seen it yet or not, but it's about the barrel traveling down the road and going around, and it ends up over at the school and stuff. And so... There's a little movie coming out with a little voiceover on it, so that's kind of cool. So we want to make sure that you're aware of our Blue Barrel every Wednesday uh, from 10 a.m. to 2. We're taking up collection for food uh, for Roxanna Schools. They have a giveaway where cars line up at the school over here, and they go by and they put bags of groceries into those cars. And we have been a big part of that uh, ministry all this summer long, and these families in this community have really helped. We also want to give a shout out to Prairie Farms out of Grant City, Illinois, who has donated last month, they donated 200 gallons of half gallon milks. And they're going to do the same thing again uh, this coming Wednesday. Uh, so we want to uh, say thank you to them also. So it's great. So uh, bring in your donations, put them in the barrel, 10 to 2, and uh, we'll be uh, uh, delivering those uh, things over next door to the schools and the families in our community can have groceries and things to eat uh, all summer long, so we're glad for that. And it takes about every 30 days we do it, so it's, uh, it's really good. So you do, donate every week, and then after 30 days, we deliver it all. And we donate every week, 30 days, we deliver it all. So it works out really well, and we're, we're enjoying uh, working with the uh, school nurse over there uh, in the school district uh, to get these things done. All right, again, the Bibles, we're in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to look at submission today, part 1. And we want to see this scripture here in verses 21 through 25. When you read the scriptures, you may say it has nothing to do with submission. Is what you would first say when you read it. But we want to look at it deeper today as we get in our message. It says in 1 Peter 2, 20, verse 21, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is, he is your example, and you must follow his steps. He never sinned or deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried out our, carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you were healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls." When Moses was leading the children of Israel, the exodus out of Egypt, God called the children of Israel a stiff-necked people. Now, I don't know how many of you think that they're stiff-necked people today, but I guarantee there probably is, right? Things that have not changed in today's society much from people being called that. There's still some of those people around. We often find it hard to bow to someone's wishes, wants, or even demands. Do you have that problem? Bowing to someone's wishes or demands, all of us do. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. Don't tell me what to do. Have you not heard a kid say that before to their parents? Don't tell me what to do. My favorite thing that a kid tells a parent is, I wish I was never born. That's my favorite thing. I heard one person say one time, well, if you would have asked, I would have said no. That's funny. And you can say that to your kids, but we got kids that say, don't tell me what to do. And they play that out in their actions. Just the word submission literally raises the hair on the back of our necks as believers in Christ. Because he's asking us to do something. 
He's wanting something from us, maybe more than what we're willing to give. And because of that, our hair on the back of our necks begin to stand up. Our first response is, hey, I don't have to do what you say. That's our first response when it comes to Christ. That's the sinful nature that speaks inside of us. But Peter says that submission is a part of a Christian's life, and it gives the ultimate example of submission in Christ. At the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3, Peter talks about the relationship that we have. And all of them, he urges us to be submissive, he says. Be submissive in relationship to the government rules. He tells us to submit to all human authority. Even though we think they're ridiculous, some laws are. It says to submit. He talks about slaves and masters, but in our day, it would be employees and bosses, wouldn't it? He tells the employees to submit yourselves to your boss, 1 Peter 2.18, right? That's what he says. Then there's marriage. Oh, this is one of our favorites. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands. Hallelujah. And, hus and husbands, in the same way, live with your wives. 1 Peter 3, verse 1 and 7. Finally, Peter mentions the relationship with the church. Finally, all of us should be of one mind, he says, sympathize with each other, love one another as sisters and brothers in Christ, be tenderhearted, and keep a humble attitude, he says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 8. Peter urges us to be submissive, but the question here is why? Why does he ask us to be submissive? In the middle of these passages on relationship, Peter talks about Jesus Christ. He tells us that Jesus is the ultimate example of submission, and we are to follow his pattern set by Christ, right? And if I'm going to be submissive, then Christ is my ultimate example. So let's see the first thing, the priority of submission. Priority. Peter says that we are all called to submission for believers. In Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22, the scribes and a disciple uh, come to Jesus and desire to follow him. This is what Jesus says. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers of religious law said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. That's what he said. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in. And birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me now, he says. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Matthew chapter 8, 18 through 22. Jesus does not say to them, come on along, the more the merry, this is going to be so much fun, why don't you join me? That's not what he said. To one he says, foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That's what he said to one. When the other asks permission to remain with his father until his father dies, Jesus replies, let the spiritually dead bury their dead. Right? Quite literally, Jesus is, uh, tells one of them to consider the cost of sacrifice required in following Jesus Christ. Christ. And the other, he demands that he be the priority. He says, follow me now, didn't he, in the scripture. The message of Jesus is that we must be submissive to him to follow him. If you're going to say, I am a follower of Christ, then you must be submissive to him. See, Dietrich Bonhoeffer begins, begins the book, The Cost of Discipleship, in these words. This is what he says in his book. Chief Grace is the deadly enemy of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. I want you to think about it. Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. We are fighting for costly grace. See, Bonhoeffer wrote these words in the 1930s, and they still ring true even to this day. If we think we can pledge all, all our allegiance to Jesus but not submit to his lordship, then we cheapen the grace of God. Now, I want you to think about it. If you say, I pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ, but you will not submit to him and his lordship, then you cheapen the grace of God. When Bonhoeffer says the enemy of the church is cheap grace, he is talking about the lack of submission. That's what he's talking about. We lack that. 
I'm often shocked uh, to discover how people complain about how hard life is. And then the next breath, they say, I just thought, thought following Christ would be far, so much easier than what it is. What they mean to say is, I thought I could live without submission. That's what they're saying. I, I, I think I could live with Christ, but I don't want to submit. I think I want Jesus in my life, but I don't want any of the submission part. Dr. Stephen Olford makes a profound statement that many of you have heard. He says that Jesus is not Lord of all, then he's Lord not of all. That's true. That's true. Peter says if you call yourself a Christian, then you are called to be in submission. That's what he says. We do not have a choice as believers in this issue. Submission is required. That brings us to the second thing. There's a path of submission. The path of submission. But how do we live submissive lives is what somebody would ask. Pastor, how do I live a submissive life? How, how do I submit to Jesus in everyday things? Peter defines a submissive life by the example of Jesus himself. According to Peter, submission is not retaliating for wrongs that are suffered. That's not where it comes from. According to Peter, submission is not retaliating for wrongs suffered. It is not saying one thing but doing something else. Submission is not bound to get even or threatening to return suffering for suffering. That's not what submission is all about. Oftentimes in the high-pressure world of politics, business, or the motto is often if it, 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 it get them before they get you and make sure you take care of number one. That's what business and politics a lot of times says. Get what's coming to you, right? Take care of number one. Stick it to them before they stick it to you. That's what they say. I've had people talk about uh, their marriages and how their marriages have fallen apart. They talk about how the other, other person did not make them feel something anymore. They wanted something else in their marriage. I've heard people complain that my preaching was too dry, too long, too short, too shallow, too deep. Too many illustrations, not enough illustrations, and all that was from the same Sunday message. <laughs> that happens. It happens. See, and all that was from that same Sunday's message. See, in business, politics, marriage, the church, if we're not careful, everything will center on how it benefits us. Right? You follow me? Say amen. 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 See, it is easy, easy to become a stiff-necked people who scream, I am in control here, and I will get what I want. I am in control here, and I'm going to get what I want. See, in the Old Testament, there was the law of the claw. Have you ever heard of that? Have you ever looked at the talons of an eagle or a hawk? Listen to this. The law of the claw states, an eye for an eye and a tooth for the tooth. Somebody gets me, it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. They punch me in the face, I'm going to punch them back twice as hard. They hit me with something, I'm going to find a bigger stick. Right? Folks, that's the law of the claw. Talons of those major uh, predators, eagles, hawks, etc., predatory birds, those things can inflict some major damage on somebody when you look at how strong they are and how sharp they are. Most of, us, uh, most of us in this room sometimes even live by the law of the claw, don't we? I'm going to get you before you get me. Or if you get me, I'm going to get you worse. Right? See, if you hurt me, then I will seek my claws and you would hurt you. But Jesus addressed the law of the claw when he said, You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Now, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 5 when you get time. And look at verses 38 and verse 42. Matthew 5, 38 and verse 42. But what if they are mean, you might say? What if the person's mean? What if they can't be trusted? Do you know what they have done in the past? You know what they've done to me? Do you know? Has anybody ever told you the story of how they've hurt me or hurt something that I let them borrow? Have you heard the story? Right? Jesus says, do not repay evil with evil. Isn't that what he says? 
The ends do not justify the means. Just submission to Christ means I'm not out for revenge. I'm not out to make somebody suffer just because I wanted to suffer, just because they hurt me. If I submit to Jesus Christ, my outlook on things is totally different. And the closer I draw to Jesus, the closer I get to God, the more I have Jesus in my life, the more I become submissive to his will and his way. His way. That's the point. See, what it is, is we're all willing to say, whatever your will is, God, I will follow. And we will follow to a certain extent. But sometimes we don't want to walk in the way of Christ. <clears throat> Think about it. The people that crucified Christ, did Jesus use the law of the claw on those people? What did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He did not rain down fire from heaven. He did not consume anybody on that day. The ground did not open up and swallow everybody, right? Jesus was submissive to God's will. He was submissive to God's way. And for me to be submissive, I have to be submissive to his will, yes, but also to his way. That's where the struggle is in my life. That's where the struggle is. Being submissive in the way of Christ. Walking in his way, thinking the way he thinks, treating people the way he wants them to be treated. When I see faults, when I see uh, injustice, right? I still must treat the people the way Jesus wants them to be treated. I should not go after revenge upon them, see? Repaying evil for evil. See, Peter points out these are not just words to Jesus. When he endured the agony on the cross, he was beaten, mocked, tortured, humiliated, and even killed, right? And for what? For what? He was innocent, wasn't he? Pilate even said that he found no fault in Jesus. A man who had done nothing wrong, suffered a horrible, gruesome punishment, yet he did not demand his way. Wow. Jesus did not come to set up a kingdom and say, I am the king, and everybody needs to bow down right now, and everybody would have done that. That isn't what he did. Jesus humbled himself, even all the way to the cross, amen? And he took on the gruesome punishment and did not demand his own way. Wow. See, that's the way we're talking about. Paul says that he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. See, Jesus tells us to be submissive. And then he models submissiveness as he suffers and dies on the cross. So I want you to go back up to 1 Peter in your Bibles. Most of you have them there. 1 Peter, chapter 2. And I want you to think about everything that I've shared with you today, and I'm going to reread this scripture one more time. It says, For God called you to do good. Listen to it. Even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, He is your example. And you must follow his steps. In other words, follow his way. Isn't that what it says? He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted. Listen to his way. Are you following me? His way? He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God. Where are we supposed to leave our problems? Somebody does us wrong, somebody treats us badly, somebody doesn't do what they should be doing, there's injustice. Where are we supposed to go? In the hands of God. Right? I'm not supposed to go to the barn and get the pitchfork and torch and go show up their house. Right? And demand justice. That's not what I'm supposed to do. He's given us what we're supposed to do right here in our scripture today. He did not retaliate when he's insulted, no threat, or did when he suffered, he left it in the case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. 
Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your soul. See, there's a way to Jesus Christ. There's a way. And we've got to follow the submissive way of Christ. Not eye for an eye, not tooth for a tooth, not punch me, I'll punch you harder attitude, but the attitude of Jesus Christ. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. That's what he's commanded us to do. In closing, the awful word submission, right? In every church service, no matter where you go in the United States, pastor says, I'm preaching on submission. Everybody says, oh, Lord, have mercy. Right? One of those messages, right? We dread it. We run from it. We try to ignore it. But once we see the submission of Christ and we realize we're called to live like that, submission goes from awful to filling us with awe. Amen? Because of the submissive example of Christ, my life will never be the same. The question is, how about you? Have you accepted the gift of Jesus and where he died in your place? You can this morning, right here today. You can receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because of the example of Jesus, how he changed my life, I want God to use my life to reach others. What can I do, Lord, to reach other people for you? So I submit to him and allow him to work in me and through me and around me. The question is, what's your desire? I want to be submissive to Christ. I want Christ to use me, but what's your desire today? Do you want your way or are you willing to give up your demands and even your freedoms so that God can use you to touch someone else's life? Amen. Someone else's life question now is, will you submit to God? Will you submit to God? Would you stand with me? If you want your life to be different, if you want your life to be changed, if you want to walk a new pathway of life, if you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, we invite you to pray this prayer today and receive Jesus in your life. If you're already saved, we invite you to pray that you will submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, I already know you as Savior, but Lord, help me to submit not only to your will, Lord, but to your way. That should be your prayer today if you're a believer in Christ. Please close your eyes. Pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you prayed that prayer either here in this room or over by Facebook by watching my television, we believe that if you believed it in your heart, your mind, and your soul, the Bible says that you're saved. We ask that you please contact us. Let us know that you received Jesus so that we can give you a book on your next steps with Christ. We want to share with you the good news of Jesus and how you can live the abundant life in Him, joy unspeakable and full of glory. We thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next week. And we invite anybody in this room that has a prayer a request or a thing they want to pray about, anything, whatever it is, I'll be at the front of this room right here by the stage, and I will pray with you individually. However long it takes, I'll stay here, and I will pray with you. Please come and see me, and, and I'll pray with you today. I encourage you to do that today, and God bless you, and thank you.